Um, so I'm going to talk about, uh, we'll start with talking about some web input events. Um, so here I've put together the like class hierarchy of all the different kinds of input events. Um, there's like at the very top level, you've got UI events and then many other types of non-input events. And those are things like animation events, um, message events, various things. Um, confusingly, uh, under UI event, there's input event, which is just um, for text editors with um, types like form, format superscript or insert line break. It specifies those additional um, abilities. Composition event is an interesting one, too. That's when you're using a uh, virtual keyboard or an IME. It gives you the, the characters generated by that input method. Um, there's things like focus. Pointer events can be any of touch, mouse, stylus events. Um, and each of these classes also has a type field to further specify the specific type. So like uh, for a pointer event, you could have the type of like mouse over touchdown, um, that sort of, or sorry, these are in mouse and touch events or key up in key events. Curious, slide got duplicated or something. Uh, anyways, <laughs> so, um, You'll, you'll notice that there was both touch events and pointer events for dealing with touch. And I wanted to briefly touch on that. Um, no pun intended. So uh, originally on the web, there was just mouse. Um, and then when the iPhone launched, Apple added touch events to Safari. And eventually, they, they put together a standard for touch events. Um, Touch events have also been used for some stylus events over the time, but they were kind of a poor fit. And so there's, uh, eventually, Microsoft came up with a standard to wrap all of the different pointer style events, uh, pointer events. Um, and there's like a few fundamental differences between these. The, the main one, I think, is that when you have multiple simultaneous touches, touch events aggregates them all into a single touch move event, whereas with pointer events, they're each considered a separate pointer that's moving around. Uh, but the other big difference is that pointer events are actually subclasses or of mouse events. So they are backwards compatible with mouse events. Um, and it's worth saying that like all of our future development towards improving input methods is going into the pointer event spec. So there's things like explicit capture uh, and other API methods that are only available in pointer events. Safari has now shipped them in Safari 13. So it's um, pointer events will be the canonical standard for pointers going forward. So let's talk a little bit about how the event is dispatched. Um, so we start by finding the event target. And for keyboard events, this is um, this event target node for document, which looks at uh, if you have a focused element, otherwise the body or the document element, um, and it will choose that as its target. Um, mouse touch and pointer events, on the other hand, use hit test result at location. So depending on where your pointer is, it will find the element that's under your pointer and uh, target that. So in this case, it's, it's the button. Um, so normally, all mouse events are hit tested. Um, touch events have an interesting behavior where they set implicit capture when you touch down. So this means that the target that you touch down on remains the target for the rest of the events for that touch. Um, so for mouse, for example, if you were to mouse down on the submit button, and move over the input button, the mouse moves would go to the input button. But with touch, you uh, it captures on the input button, so the, the moves go to the button. This can actually end up being really confusing when like the element is removed from the document, but it's still receiving events because it was captured. And pointer events um, lets you do either method where uh, default by default it's not captured, but you have an explicit API to request capture. <clears throat> 
So uh, let's get into how you add event listeners. Um, so add event listener is the generic method for listening for input. Um, the first argument you specify what type and then a callback function. And the third argument um, is now a dictionary that lets you specify parameters about the type of event listener you want to add. For example, whether it should be a capture listener and you do your event handling, you can call stop propagation and prevent default on the event. We'll get into what these things do, but uh, first let's talk about the actual dispatch. So I mentioned you've got your, your targeted button here. If you were to dispatch a click, it would actually, um, in the capture phase, deliver the event from the top of the document all the way down to the button to all of the event listeners that had been added with capture. So first it would call the event listener on the body in this case, and then the one on the button. And then in the bubbling phase, it goes in the reverse direction. Um, this is where most people would add their event listeners. Capture is usually for special kind of event handling. And so in this case, um, the body has two event listeners. They're called in the order that they were added. And then it will bubble. It would normally bubble up, except that the second one has called stop propagation, which prevents further propagation of the event. Um, so then there's also a default action for many events. If no handler calls prevent default, then the browser will perform that action after event handling is complete. So for example, clicking will toggle checkboxes, typing, entering text into a text box. There's also the generation of gesture events, like uh, for scrolling or um, pinch zoom. As an aside, um, you can add your event handler on any ancestor of the event you're interested or the target you're interested in. And this is a common pattern called event delegation, where um, frameworks will, instead of adding event handlers to every single button they're interested in, will add an event handler on the root of the document and then look at the target to figure out what thing you clicked on or wanted to interact with. Um, and this is going to be an important pattern going forward, uh, which we'll talk about later. So instead of adding like three listeners in this case for the three interactable elements, they would add one listener on the root. Um, so I mentioned scrolling earlier. And to generate scrolls, we generate these uh, gesture events. So they are not web exposed events, but they exist in Blink and in Chrome. Um, and they're how we define the thing that your um, touches turn into. So imagine you put your finger down, you get a touch start, and you get a gesture tap down. Um, what this is going to do is uh, set like active classes on things. So uh, you'll get um, hover behavior, that sort of thing. Um, when you start to move your finger, uh, you'll get touch move. Eventually, once you exceed a certain distance, you get this gesture tap cancel. And so what this means is that your finger has moved far enough that releasing it will no longer generate a tap, which would turn into a click. And you would begin scrolling at this point. So continued movement scrolls. And then eventually, when you release your finger, the scroll is over. And it may start a fling if the uh, scroll handling code has determined that you released with enough velocity. The gesture detector has uh, many different gestures it can generate from touch. Um, I'm not going to get into all of these, but this is the kinds of events that can be generated based on handling of the touch events. Um, as you're all probably aware, um, Chrome uses separate processes for the renderer and browser. Um, primarily, this means that you're, you can still like close the tab or interact with other tabs, even if one is slow. Um, but this also has important implications for input. So input events come into the browser process. Um, and how they come in depends on platform. And that's out of scope. But in general, we wrap them with a platform event, which is type deft to the native event type, um, and then create a UI event, which wraps that platform event and dispatch to the appropriate target. So when that target is a render widget, the events get sent to the renderer process to be handled. <clears throat> 
And the result of handling that event goes back to the browser so that the browser can generate gesture events based on whether the events were handled. So there's a bit of a problem. Um, many sites have a lot of work running on their, web, their main thread. Um, this is an example, I believe, from Facebook, but it's I took this trace a long time ago. Um, and so you could imagine if you were to try to scroll on this page, it could be quite a while if, if you start your scroll at the wrong time before the browser would know that the main page didn't handle your, your touchdown. So we have threaded event dispatch, which is we've introduced a compositor thread um, that gets a chance to handle the events first. And the compositor has a simplified representation of the page. It knows where there are scrollers. Um, it knows where there are click targets, that sort of thing. Um, so for example, this button here may be a non-fast scrollable region because it has an event handler. So going back to the overall picture, when you touch on the render widget, that gets sent over to the compositor. In this case, the compositor sees that the place where you touched is over a non-fast scrollable region. So that gets sent to the main thread. And then the main thread says, oh, this wasn't handled. And we start our scroll. Um, and so you can see this in a trace as well. This is a, a trace taken from Chrome tracing. So browser to the compositor to the main thread, back to the browser, and then generating scroll events. Um, we also coalesce events. So if the main thread is uh, not able to handle every single touch event, it will receive a simplified version. So um, when there's an event that can't be coalesced, such as a touch start, we just flush all of the pending events, which would be like a touch move of 10.5 before the touch start. Uh, or when we generate a, a mainframe, we'll send all of the coalesced events. Um, so with coalesced events, there's a bit of a problem if you're trying to like write a drawing app where um, you know, maybe the user's drawn a, a nice curve, but the event you get is just a straight line. Um, <laughs> so for this, uh, one of the extensions to pointer events is that you can get the events which were coalesced into it. And this allows you to draw the, the smooth line that was actually um, picked up by the browser process. And then we have similar extensions for latency. So you can imagine that um, by the time you've drawn this line in response to the user drawing, there would be a visible gap between their pen and the line that you've drawn. So pointer, event, uh, pointer events expose this get predicted events API, which lets the OS provide its prediction of uh, the next few events. I don't know specifically what um, latency it predicts for. I believe it's you know on the order of a frame or two. Um, but this will allow you to draw a predicted line, which you would then erase in the next frame and replace with the real events. Um, so I'll just touch on some ongoing challenges, and then hopefully we can get into some questions without running out of time. Um, so remember, I, talk, I mentioned event delegation earlier. Um, if you have an event listener added to the root of the document, then your entire page is a non-fast scrollable region. This isn't um, great for performance. So uh, what the pattern that we've been encouraging is to add passive event listeners. And in fact, we've added an intervention that event listeners on the root are forced to be passive unless they're explicitly declared otherwise. So when you have a passive event listener, you are not able to prevent the event, which means that you will hear about the event, but it won't prevent scrolling. So we can start the scroll right away. Um, but you might imagine that there are cases where you don't want it to scroll right away. For example, uh, maybe this D button here is something that can slide to the left and the right as you move your finger over it. For this, we have touch action where you can declare that for a given region, the only directions that can be panned are, in this case, the Y direction. Or you can restrict whether or not pinch can happen. 
And uh, these regions get passed over to the compositor thread as a, a rectangle to say like in this area, we know for sure that we can pan in the Y direction, but any other gesture we need to check with the main thread. This allows you to still have fast scrolling while handling other gestures. Um, one of the caveats though, is that we don't have complex overlap detection. So imagine that you have these three different uh, regions where you know one prevents all events and the other two prevent pan Y and pan X. So here's the recs that would be generated. And what we have to do on the compositor is basically the intersection of these things. So if you touch in a region that intersects both the pan Y and the pan X region, we don't know which one is actually going to be hit. So we assume that we always have to check with the, the main thread before we can start the pan. Um, so this is like a brief overview of how this works where um, in the compositor, we determine whether the action you're trying to do matches the allowed touch actions. And the allowed touch actions are intentionally pessimistic. So if they have been determined to allow be allowed, we know that nothing will prevent those actions. But if they're prevented, we don't necessarily know. So we have to accumulate um, pending scrolls, for example, in case we later find out from the main thread that it was allowed. Um, so you, when you start using this as a developer, you might be thinking like, how do you know um, when your gesture has turned into a, like something that has prevented scrolling or a scroll? For example, you might want you know, swiping to the right um, to move an item over to the right. But if that were to turn into a vertical scroll, you might want it to snap back in place. And for this, you can check the cancelable flag on the event because uh, at the point where we um, determine that this is a pan Y instead of a pan X, we will send uncancelable events. And you can use that to do a, a reset of your effect. So um, that's my, my summary. Uh, we have a, a team page on chromium.org um, and the team, well, as uh, Hal mentioned, the team has recently been combined with the animations team to form the interactions team, but input specifically covers the components, blink input, blink scroll, and internals compositing scroll.